may uh, call the uh, subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands to order for a hearing today on H.R. 980. Uh, today we'll hear testimony on this on H.R. 980, the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act of 2009. In the midst of the, this spring season with people heading outdoors to enjoy themselves, it brings a, it, it seems a fitting time to discuss the beauty and the splendor of our lands across the West. H.R. 980, introduced by our colleague, Representative Carolyn Maloney, would designate approximately 19 million acres of these Western lands as wilderness. It would also designate 2,000 miles of wild and scenic rivers and establish two new designations for land conservation. If signed into law, it would be the second largest wilderness designation in this country's history, behind only the 1980 Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. A bill, this bill is admirable and ambitious, driven by a true desire to do what's best for these lands in this country, a true commitment to these wild and beautiful places. This bill responds to the chal challenges facing the, con the conservation of the Northern Rockies ecosystem by addressing its protection on a landscape level, which is, which is unprecedented. As a strong supporter of wilderness protection, I am, in, I am uh, intrigued by this approach. I also feel that this uh, legislation, uh, at, at because of the size of its proposal and the complexity, presents some unique challenges and will obviously in invoke some strong emotions on both sides of the issue. In today's hearing, we will explore both the benefits of this legislation as well as the concerns. So I look forward to an honest and rigorous discussion about the merits of the bill. I also believe that part of the discussion should be uh, on this legislation, how it will deal with, accommodate, and lend uh, some support uh, on the issue of climate change. I, I am finally one of the HR 90's biggest supporters and a dedicated wilderness defender, Carol King, is here to testify as before us today. She has been a long time and tireless advocate for this legislation, and I am pleased that Ms. King and all of our witnesses are able to join us. I look forward to hearing from all of you. I would like to turn to um, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Hastings, for any comments you might have, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for the courtesy of, uh, of having me here on your uh, subcommittee. And I first want to thank the uh, witnesses who are testifying today, particularly those witnesses on panel three, uh, from the areas that are most affected by this very far-reaching bill, and those who have traveled across the country to give us their views, and who I might add, in all likelihood, were not consulted about this legislation. Let me explain. This bill is unique. There is no pretense of it being a consensus bill that incorporates carefully considered Forest Service or BLM management plans, nor was it influenced by the moderating accommodations that occur when various interests, sportsmen, timber workers, state resource agencies, local businesses, private property owners, and those whose livelihood depends on public lands seek common ground. The collaborative public process is designed to ensure that competing demands are considered and weighed in a bill of this magnitude are simply dispensed with in this bill. 2,000 miles of wild and scenic rivers are designated in this bill, designated without even being studied, without even being studied for suitability. Entirely new categories of land restrictions, such as biological corridors, whatever that may be, would be enacted into law. These new concepts are not even proposed to be tested in a small experimental area. This bill covers vast expanses of land, tens of millions of acres. It is the largest proposed wilderness de designation outside of the immense wilderness in Alaska, as the chairman mentioned. The premise underlying this bill is, apparently, that wilderness designation is the only way to protect outdoor environments. I don't share that view, Mr. Chairman. I do believe that we, I do not believe we must lock away the public's lands from public access in order to conserve it. I have seen, seen too many healthy private forests, too many healthy actively managed federal and state lands, 
to hold a wilderness only view i have seen many wilderness areas plagued by fires insect damage and many other wounds of neglect wilderness areas are frankly not all that they are portrayed to be and finally mr chairman i must say i am troubled by legislation whose sponsors live far away from the communities and districts that they are targeting communities and districts that would be subjected to very real economic harm and lost jobs if this bill were to become law mr chairman not a single one not a single one of these bills seventy two sponsors represents a district that would be affected so clearly this legislation is being pushed by groups that are out of touch with and do not represent the views of those americans that would be a directly affected by this bill so with that mr chairman i thank you for your courtesy and i look forward to the testimony of the of the witnesses and if i could uh, mr uh, chairman uh, i have a letter here from the governor of idaho a former colleague of ours butch otter and i'd like to ask unanimous consent that his remarks in opposition to H.R. 980 be included in the record. Without exception. Do you have any, uh, any comments? Or no? Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> let, let me welcome our colleagues uh, and let me uh, uh, begin with uh, Representative Carolyn Mal Maloney from New York, uh, the, the sponsor of the legislation uh, for her comments. Uh, regarding H.R. 980. I, I uh, thank you very much, Chairman Grijalva, for holding this hearing and for being uh, one of the lead sponsors of the legislation. And I thank our Ranking Member Bishop, members of the subcommittee. I thank all of you for allowing me to testify today about H.R. 980, the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act. And I particularly thank the chairman for being the, the lead, the absolute lead co-sponsor of NARIPA. So far this, uh, in this Congress, NARIPA has earned, gained the support of 75 bipartisan co-sponsors from over 30 states. It has grassroots support that is deep and strong in the areas affected by the legislation. It is supported by the Natural Resources Defense Council, the Sierra Club, Alliance for the Wild Rockies, Friends of the Clearwater, the Endangered Species Coalition, the Humane Society, and over the years, literally hundreds and hundreds of other organizations and local businesses in Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And I'd like to submit to the record these support letters. NARIPA differs from traditional state-by-state -state wilderness bills by offering a variety of designations that work in concert to achieve one goal, the protection of an entire functioning ecosystem. It is a bill focused on sound science, not on arbitrary political boundaries. After all, watersheds don't stay within one congressional district, animals don't know when they've crossed a political boundary, and forests span millions of miles with no regard for state lines. Mr. Chairman, I know that there will be a healthy discussion on the bill this afternoon, and I want to start out by talking uh, generally about what the bill does and what it does not do. I am pleased that later you'll hear testimony from experts from the region, some of whom have been working on this bill for longer than I have. At its core, NARIPA does three simple things. It protects, it employs, and it saves. NARIPA protects. It protects entire functioning ecosystems by designating 24 million acres of America's premier roadless lands as wilderness. It also protects the rivers and streams that are the last habitats for many of America's wild trout uh, stocks by designating some 1,800 miles of rivers and streams as wild and scenic rivers. Most importantly, by protecting natural biological corridors, NARIPA links all these wild places together into a functioning ecological whole. It also employs, the bill will create about 2,300 good paying jobs to restore over 1 million acres of damaged habitat and watershed. In trying economic times, green jobs like these are tremendously important. 
Finally, Heripa saves. It saves taxpayers' money by eliminating wasteful subsidies to the timber industry to conduct logging on federal lands. These forests are money losers, and ultimately the American taxpayers are paying to continue logging in these particular federal forests. Naripa saves taxpayers money by prohibiting road building and logging in the areas de designated as wilderness. I want to be very clear about what Naripa does not do. It does not impact private landowners. It impacts only public lands, lands owned by all Americans. We all have a right and a responsibility to protect our precious resources. Now, you'll hear some people say that Naripa is uh, not an appropriate bill, and, and my good friend uh, Mr. Hastings said that uh, no one from the area uh, is sponsoring this. But I, I will tell you that uh, there is no idea that is not worthy of being debated in this Congress, and certainly one that has such a strong number of co-signers and supporters of it. In the prior Congress, we had over 150, and uh, many of the people came from the region. Uh, when I first was elected, many people, I, I came from these states, Montana, Utah, Wyoming, and they came to my office and said they had this important bill that they had been working on for years, and they could not find a co-sponsor. And uh, part of those lands belong to me and every other American, and I certainly believe that every bill has the right to be debated and discussed and should be introduced, particularly one that has earned the support of over 75 of my colleagues in a bipartisan way. This bill is a homegrown grassroots bill that by, by necessity had to go elsewhere uh, for a sponsor. And uh, I will tell you a story, I, if I could, Mr. Chairman, because the day, it was really very near the Westway project. We had a project in New York that the governor, the mayor, everybody supported it. And they wanted to build this new highway and build out over the water and there were a group of uh, environmentalists. There were about 10 of us. We opposed it. We had certain grounds. We opposed this bill. And after roughly 10 years, uh, it finally came down from the Army Corps of Engineers and the courts that it was illegal, wasteful, could not be built. So I would say that you can't say no to something because you don't like their, the sponsor of it or you think the sponsor should be from a different state. All of us have a, the right to introduce uh, legislation, and it's been uh, – uh, a great success that Westway, it's, uh, that particular environmental project was uh, saved for the habitat and, and for, the, for the, um, the, the fish and the water and so forth. But I, I will continue to, to debate this issue in a thoughtful and responsible way. If nothing else, the American people should take comfort in the fact that we continue to debate how much land to protect instead of whether to protect land at all. Some years ago, two Naripa supporters from Manhattan, Montana, wrote to me and said, and I quote, we feel that there is a little ray of hope for the incredible but dwindling wild lands we are so lucky to live near and love. All of us have a responsibility to sustain that hope. I urge my colleagues uh, to support this bill, and I hope that the chairman will um, will support it and move it towards a, a markup. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. And let me now uh, ask uh, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Reber, uh, if he would uh, comment on 980. And the uh, floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Bishop and, and Hastings. For the record, I do like the sponsor of the bill, and I am glad she's from another state. <laughs> I want to thank you for allowing me to return to the Subcommittee on National – I'll slow down if you need um, – the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands to testify again on behalf of the people of Montana. I'm here representing county commissioners, state representatives, ranchers, timber workers, sportsmen and women, and recreationalists who have expressed their opposition to the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act in letters, faxes, emails, survey responses, and even a rapidly growing Facebook group. All told, I've heard from almost 10,000 folks who live, work, and raise families in the Northern Rockies. I can report that more than 96% of those who contacted me oppose this bill. The land Naripa affects is represented by only seven members of Congress, including myself, far fewer than the 75 current co-sponsors of the bill. 
it's telling however that as mr hastings said none of the seventy five co sponsors are from the districts that narita impacts this bill carves out more than one hundred twenty four million acres of new wilderness that area is larger than any of the districts represented by any of the seventy five co sponsors of the bill representative maloney who is the lead sponsor of this bill could fit her new york district in the new wilderness created by narita almost three thousand times and well while you may have the votes to force your will on the people who live in the northern rockies i'm here to tell you that doing so isn't in anyone's best interest not the folks who live on this land not the folks that they were elected to represent it's not even in the best interest of the ecosystem we want to protect let me be absolutely clear the folks i represent support responsible land conservation Currently, there are more than 30 million acres of state and federal land in Montana alone. That's nearly one acre in every three. As a state where lifestyles and livelihoods depend on the land we live on, it's one of our top priorities, and we do an outstanding job. To manage these lands, stakeholders come to the table to formulate consensus-driven solutions at the local level. The federal government could learn a lot from our solutions that center around three words, cooperation, trust, consensus for the montanans who work till graze hunt fish hike camp and enjoy this land conservation is not only a daily personal choice it's our way of life real conservation isn't about making tough decisions for someone else who lives thousands of miles away yes that's exactly what naripa does the workable solutions we need won't come from washington dc we need to reach a balance that truly reflects montana not the ideals of powerful special interests. From Washington, D.C., it's impossible to smell the smoke from hundreds of raging wildfires that will be harder to fight if Naripa passes. From Washington, D.C., it's impossible to see the 1.6 million plus acres of dead and dying trees that result from pine beetle infections that will be more difficult to manage if Naripa passes. From Washington, D.C., you can't watch a hillside change colors as indigenous plants are slowly strangled out of existence by toxic weeds that are impossible to fight once Naripa passes. From Washington, D.C., you can't hear the frustration in the voice of a hunter or a fisherman who can no longer get to the secluded mountain ridge where his family has gone for generations once Naripa passes. From Washington, D.C., Congress pushes for alternative energy from wind and the sun. But how can we get that power and create green jobs in the process if you effectively set up a barrier that cannot be crossed? And there's a new concern looming in the minds of the folks around Montana and the country. There aren't many things we in the Northern Rockies care more about than our Second Amendment rights. Bills like NARIPA create more stringent federal controls on land under consideration, but they don't guarantee our Second Amendment rights on that land. I'm concerned that NARIPA has no guarantee that the federal government won't someday ban firearms on these new wilderness areas the way it just did in our national parks. And at the end of the day, this is about Washington, D.C. asking and thinking. It knows how to manage the Northern Rockies better than the people who live there. I'm here to say that isn't the case. Many of Representative Maloney's constituents in New York's 14th District undoubtedly find Central Park a welcome refuge from the urban surroundings of America's most crowded city. A Montanan who visited Central Park recently shared an observation with me. Although Central Park was free of buildings and cars, Many of the open spaces were cordoned off by fences. Visitors could walk on and run on the pathways, but the fields of green grass around them were off limits. The repo models its philosophy for 24 million acres of land after the approach taken in the 843 acres of Central Park. Look, but don't touch. This approach may work in Manhattan, New York, but it doesn't work in Manhattan, Montana, and that's why I oppose this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and let me thank both my colleagues for their comments, Ed. Uh, I have no um, questions uh, for colleagues. Uh, Mr. Bishop, any questions? I do, Representative Maloney, if I could ask a couple of questions. Well, not a couple, there's several dozen. The hearing that we had on this bill last Congress, I raised several issues that dealt with private property concerns in this legislation, the protection of private property, and also prohibitions on condemnation. That was solely part, it was part of Title II, but not in Title V. 
that you really agreed that it was your intent to protect private property you wanted never to repeat kilo on your watch why didn't you make any changes in title five the gentleman has language that he would like to propose to the committee i will certainly entertain it certainly the intent of the bill is only for public lands not for private lands I believe that is clear in the bill. If you don't think it's clear enough, I would certainly uh, consider any uh, recommendations to make that stronger. Representative, but again, that's the but same thing you said two years ago. Why wasn't it fixed when you reintroduced the bill? Well, why didn't you come with your suggested language? To me, it, it says private, uh, private lands are private and public lands are public. If you, have, if you have a suggestion, we will certainly entertain it. To make it clear that it is totally that that public lands are, are all we're talking about. We are not. We are respecting private property rights. It only only concerns land that is owned by the American taxpayer. Once again, I appreciate that. But as we pointed out two years ago, is it in Title Five, Section Five Hundred Three, and Section Two Hundred Four? That's where you need to make those changes. It should have been done. Can I also ask you a couple of other things there? You also uh, are using the phrase. Um, roadless lands greater than. The state of the art to try and solve that problem is roadless federal lands or defined lands somewhere. Once again, two years ago we brought that up. Why has it not been fixed in this bill? Again, if you have some language that uh, you want to clarify it with, we'll certainly entertain it. Well, we did two years ago. I, I, I don't want you simply to brush off the bill and give us back the same thing. This is the fourth time this same bill has been here. So last Congress, you also promised to find out the cost of implementing this legislation. What is it? The cost of implementing this. This is this is going to make money. This no, 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 I'm not saving. Jobs. I don't want savings or jobs. I want the cost of implementing. There will be a cost for the Forest Service and BLM. Once again, two years ago we talked about that. You and Mr. Shays didn't have the answer. You said you get it. What is it? Well, we can uh, go to OMB and request a, an analysis. That's what you said two years ago again. Okay, last Congress, you didn't know what endangered species would be impacted because there would be an endangered species management change in that. Once again, you said you'd get back with us. Do you now know how many endangered species will be impacted by this bill? I do not have a specific number of endangered species. Do you know how many private inholders are going to be affected by this bill? Same question we asked two years ago. Well, private inholders are not going to be affected by this, uh, by this bill. Well, unfortunately, with the way you've written Title V, I guess they will be. But you, once again, you told us you would get back with this. You private see inholders are an issue that comes up with any wilderness bill, and NARIPA is no exception. But there is a clear answer. The Wilderness Act provides for reasonable access to private inholdings and the agencies decide what reasonable access means. Ms. Maloney, as Mr. Kildee and I told you last time you had the same bill here, we have both done wilderness bills in our area. I produced a wilderness bill that was created. Mr. Grijalva didn't think it was enough, but it was still pretty good. In that, we also researched, not only did we have every county commissioner and state legislature and government official in favor of it, we also researched who had private holdings within wilderness areas. The wilderness areas in this country are dotted with private inholdings. We searched them out. We found out who they were. We talked to them. We made changes in our map based on everyone who had a personal private interest in that wilderness area. And the only question I have is in this, in this conglomerate of 24 million acres, do you know how many private inholdings are there? Well, the agencies decide what reasonable access means and their, their access is protected under law now. Reasonable access has nothing to do with the question. The question is how many private inholdings are there? I do you either know or you don't know. I don't know how many exactly how many private inholdings are there. All right, according to the map, the map has never changed in this bill. It is now decades old. Uh, one of your supporters said that this map only affects the five areas. Does this map, map affect Utah and my district? Well, I... Uh, the map is here. You know your district better than I do. The map uh, that's true. Determine. That's very true. Mm -hmm. And let me just tell you, contrary to, this, to the uh, indications we were given before, yes, the way the verbiage is written in here, it does now impact into Utah as well. So it's not just Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, <sighs> British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the North Pole that have some concern about this particular thing. But once again, we were told opposite information. 
the map that is presented that goes along with this has not been updated in decades. It is wrong. It is inconsistent. Those are cycles. It, it has, it has been done. updated. It has been updated every year by, by, the, um, uh, by the organizations in the communities that are working on this. Those are the only ones who are available, and you haven't gone through the process of updating it with legal counsel. Why is there a reason why you believe it's okay for this legislation to move forward without support of a single elected official in any of the affected areas? It has a, a great deal of support from the men and women who live in the neighborhoods, and uh, we are working to earn and gain uh, more support. How do you quantify that? Well, I'd like to put in the record a, a list of letters that have come into my office. Uh, Can you quantify that? You don't have a single elected official who's supporting this. Can you quantify the alleged rank and file members who support this? Last time there was a letter supposedly from Manhattan, Manhattan, Montana that you introduced. Mr. Reberg had X number of letters from Manhattan, Manhattan Montana that refuted that. Does it, is there any quantifiable data that you have? Uh, we have uh, petitions. We have uh, leaders from the communities. Uh, and uh, you don't ha have to be elected to support a position. So there are many people in the affected areas that, uh, that support protecting lands that are owned by the federal government. But you don't have a number that goes to the many, do you? I don't have a specific number. Would you support cherry-stemmed roads into wilderness area to shore access for handicapped, including disabled hunters? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you. I realize that my five minutes is, has expired here. There are more questions, but once again, we asked two years ago. The answers are still not here. Um, draftsmanship of this particular bill we complained about two years ago. It's the same verbiage this time around. Again, if the gentleman would like to uh, support or put forward his suggested language, I, I would be very pleased to entertain it. I was hoping the gentlelady would as part of her responsibility as a sponsor. Mr. Holt, any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, if I may. Um, I'd like to get at really the, one of the central questions that has been, uh, that has been raised and, and ask uh, our col colleague, Ms. Maloney, a few questions. Um, do, do you think, Ms. Maloney, that the uh, Bridger Forest and the Sawtooth Forest and the Wallala areas belong only to Wyoming? Montana and Oregon? Federal lands belong to all of the American people and they belong to every American, every taxpayer, every citizen. D do you think that Central Park and the Statue of Liberty only belong to and are of interest to the people who live in the five boroughs of New York City? Well, Congressman, obvi or New York, uh, or obviously New Jersey, uh, the Statue of Liberty is uh, on our coins. It's a, a, a respected symbol of our, of our democracy, our opportunity, and it belongs to all of the residents in our country. Do you think when the Statue of Liberty found some structural problems that only structural engineers from Manhattan uh, would have anything uh, intelligent to say about the management of the um, uh, of the structure? Well, certainly not. Uh, it belongs to the American people, and certainly any engineer in the country has a right to to express their opinion of of how they how they feel about the Statue of Liberty and how yes. it should be repaired or used. And 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 do you think that for the roughly 399 million people? who do not live within sight of the Statue of Liberty, uh, that they have to visit it daily or weekly uh, in order to value it? No, Congressman. I think you're, you're very appropriately pointing out that, uh, that uh, you don't have to visit it, although uh, I visited many times, but uh, you, you can support it in your, with your vote, with your voice, and never have a the opportunity or the privilege to go there. In fact, Congressman, when we created the six million uh, state park, uh, is the deciding vote in the New York State Legislature was a woman who said, I will never visit that park, but I want it to be there for next generations. I want to make sure that the streams and land and animals are protected, and that was a 
a deciding vote, a very historic and important deciding vote. Uh, it, uh, I, I have noted that in uh, my efforts to look after some of the national parks in the West, uh, I've gotten impassioned appeals from people in New Jersey, some of whom have never seen those parks and never expect to, uh, for me to uh, redouble my efforts to preserve them. Uh, let me ask one other question. One of my colleagues uh, 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 referred to uh, reference uh, to wildlife corridors in here and said whatever they are. Um, in putting this bill together, uh, have you consulted with uh, wildlife biologists and ecologists to determine whether the concept of corridors is a, uh, uh, a, a modern concept of uh, ecology and uh, wildlife management? Absolutely. In fact, the corridors were written uh, into the bill and, and designated by scientists uh, within this uh, region as the last remaining caribou and the grizzly bears. And, and uh, when a bird flies from one area to another, they're not thinking about, uh, uh, you know, the state lines. They're, they're thinking about their natural habitat and where they move. And, and uh, as, we, as we really become more industrialized, uh, we, we have to work harder to make sure that we protect the habitat, the animal life, and, and the nature. What is so, per what so, is so uh, perfect, uh, I think very uh, special about this bill is the, is the corridors and seeing this as a natural habitat, not as a distinctive state, but a natural habitat that's important to uh, protect uh, for the future in our country. How many co-sponsors did you say we have at this point? We, we uh, have um, 70, 79. Um, Ms. Maloney, uh, do you think there is any one of those 79 members of Congress who comes from a district that is not affected by this legislation? Well, I think everyone is a, a, a affected, and I correct myself, uh, it's 75 co-sponsors. Uh, well, we had I, well over I 100 would, in the last one. Uh, I, I would uh, say that uh, there is not one of 435 congressional districts, and we might add the territories, um, that uh, is not affected by this legislation and would be affected positively by this, elect, uh, by this legislation. I thank you for uh, sponsoring it. I, I, I thank you for your comments and, and your understanding um, and vision. Thank you. Mr. Hirsch. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Um, my friend from New Jersey tried to uh, or equated the uh, Statue of Liberty in Central Park with this designation of uh, a wilderness area. Uh, Ms. Maloney, how many people, how many elected officials in uh, that part of New York are opposed to Central Park and the Statue of Liberty being designated or being federal lands or park lands? Oh, it, it is supported, uh, I would say, by every American in, in America. No, I'm asking about the elected officials in the, in the close environs of New York. Uh, they all support it as a national monument. And Thank you very much. Park. Mr. Reber, you mentioned in your opening statement, and you being the only representative from a huge geographical area, how many elected officials are you aware of that support this in your uh, jurisdiction? None, including our two Democrat U.S. senators. So, we, we're, so we're even up at, at that level uh, for that. And Mr. Hastings, I might point out that uh, we're not talking about the ownership of the land or the Statue of Liberty. We're talking about the management. And it, it would behoove us to remember that while we may receive letters from of support or opposition, we really need to listen to many of the land managers in places like Montana where the Forest Service suggests that the management within the existing wilderness oftentimes makes it difficult to manage the toxic weeds, to manage the dead and dying trees. And so I would never suggest, nor would I believe uh, Ms. Maloney would suggest, that we want to override the engineer's decisions on the structural imperfections within uh, the Statue of Liberty 
or central park but that's exactly what they're doing in the case of interjecting their east coast knowledge of natural resource management as i've said most recently would you buy a car manufactured by congress would you allow congressmen who have absolutely no idea or women about the management of the natural resources to go in and actively manage our force for the betterment of the wildlife of the ecosystem and that's really the crux of the whole argument here you there's been uh, I, I alluded to in my opening remarks uh, Mr. Maloney said that private property rights are not affected at all uh, in this bill uh, you and I uh, I represent a district that has a lot of federal land you obviously do it in in Montana can you give an example or two or a general overview of how private property is affected by management of, uh, of public lands in, in, the, the, in our jurisdiction? Well, the best argument I could make is a woman by the name of Margaret Reed who was up in the Cook City area whose land was surrounded during the Beartooth of Zorky discussion, unbeknownst to her, and they started limiting access and her ability to use the land as she and her husband had used it in the generations before. And all the years I staffed this committee as a staffer back in late 70s and early 80s, and I was on this committee when it was called the Interior and Insular Affairs under Mr. Chairman Udall, we fought that issue of trying to bring relief to it one single land owner, and she ended up in court. She ended up trying to appeal to the reasonableness of a federal bureaucracy that frankly didn't care, and the woman died. And hers she ever got to see any resolution and hers on was, access. Hers was private land because of the proximity to public lands. Hers was private land and an active mine that ended up being surrounded by wilderness area. It was currently surrounded. It had access to her mine. But, it's pri but, it was, but it was, I don't, my time's running out. But it was private land, and, and, and what happens is the proximity of public lands. Therefore, the jurisdiction or the governance of those public lands have an effect on private property. That is correct. And for the greater good of the government, she never saw relief and before she passed away. And could this not happen? Because I, I, I would assume that the, uh, the lot of this land is probably higher elevation. Uh, in the west, the snow falls, and the higher elevation comes down as water. Could that have an effect on private property, perhaps uh, water management, when it gets out of the federal lands? Those are the issues that need to be addressed in this bill. Water rights, hard release, and appeal. And they're not. And they're not. Okay. Thank you Mr. Ma very much. Uh, if, I, if I could uh, clarify that water rights uh, continue to be reserved as they are under current law. They're protected. We did write CBO to look at uh, the cost, and they haven't gotten back to us. And in the last hearing we had, there was a, a report by an economic analysis of, by Michael Garrity, who testified uh, two years ago, actually, on the bill. That the money does uh, that it saves money a net savings of 245 million over 10 years and that report can uh, go into the record but but clearly uh, the the intent is not to impose in any way shape or form on on private property 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 rights are, are respected well. in this country and and certainly people have access to their property and and uh, I'm not familiar with that particular case well, that he's talking Mr. about. Chairman, that if I may. Woman. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I, I just want to make this observation because this is always overlooked by people that do not have federal lands in their area of the impact it has. I, I see it all the time in my district, and I'm not impacted as greatly as, as others. I, I know the intent is never that way. I always hear that. The intent is not to do this. My goodness, the intent of the interpretation of the Endangered Species Act today is not what it was in 1971. I think most people would acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. But yet it, it has a profound impact. And, and to suggest that it, that it doesn't or the intent isn't so everything's going to go away misses the whole point. And I think this is probably the reason why. You don't see elected officials in areas that have federal land that are impacted by this that gravitate to this sort of legislation because they know firsthand, they see it on a daily basis, the impact that it has on their livelihood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and before I turn to Ms. Shea Porter for any comments or questions she may have, it, it, it's my uh, limited experience on this committee that uh, many times legislation is uh, introduced from one session to another, essentially the same language as the previous session. And then uh, if that piece of legislation hits uh, committee for markup, 
then we're, we're in the am amendment process where we clarify, change, modify, perfect uh, through members' uh, amendments. And uh, I think some of the concerns that have been raised today, it, uh, if w this bill gets to markup, uh, we'll have we'll have that opportunity to deal with uh, members' concerns through the amendment process, which in my experience has been the way it's been done in the past. Ms. Shea Porter, any questions? Thank you. I just have a comment. I have been to, believe it or not, uh, Montana, and I have been to Manhattan, Montana. My niece mm -hmm. went to school there at MSU, and it's a very, very beautiful state. And I have to tell you that I also have family and came out of New York State and New Hampshire. And New Hampshire is beautiful and small, and we're very proud of our rural heritage. New York City is vibrant, exciting, generous to a fault, a place to make it. Each place in this country has something so special about it. And so I've been a little uncomfortable, maybe feeling a little regional here, when hearing the talk about the Easterners, and I think you used the term, the greater good of the government, when really they're people. The people in New Hampshire, the state that I'm proud to represent, people in, in the Congresswoman State, New York, Everywhere, everywhere people have things that they brag about in their state because there's a natural beauty. But if you don't want your area to look like New York City, if you felt compelled to attack New York City for the way it looks and talk about Central Park, then you should be embracing this because what we're trying to do is say, look, there's an area of the country and you are blessed to live in that area of the country that won't look like this and that it's the responsibility and the obligation of people in this country to do that. So I guess what I'm saying here is that this land belongs to us too. It doesn't just belong to the people of the West. And I lived in Colorado when my husband was in the military. Stunningly beautiful state. I'm so proud of this whole country and each area belongs to all of us. And so each one of us has that. We're not the Easterners that are trying to come West. And by the way, there's plenty of Westerners who live in in the East as well. But each one of us knows that these are real treasures. And so I think what made me so uncomfortable here was the kind of dialogue, the us against them. And, and I also took some offense when you commented about being managed by Congress because we're all in Congress. The two people sitting at that table are in Congress. All of us are in Congress. And so I believe that your intention in Congress is to serve this country. And that's my intention too, and everybody else's. So it might be fun to take a, a whack at Congress, but I think we're a lot more serious here than, than the statement suggested. That what we're really trying to do is to preserve a part of the country for the people who are fortunate enough to live there and enjoy that beauty, and for the rest who will maybe be able to come to enjoy that beauty, but if not, this also is part of our ecosystem, and it's critical that we have this land left. We know about our climate change. We know about the problems we're having with water rights. And certainly, when I lived in Colorado, Colorado was always fighting with California about water rights. So this has been a long, a long-standing problem. But here's an opportunity, and I am not going to say that everything in this bill is perfect, but I think we could do a lot better if we put aside our, I'm from the East and I'm from the West, and we said, we're a nation together looking at this, trying to figure out how to best protect this land. And I think we could get a lot further if, if we lowered the level of suspicion just a little bit here. So that's, that's my comment. There's no question to anybody, except I realize that we all have good intentions here, but it's, it's not us against them. It's how do we stand together as a country to preserve, protect, and also make sure that those who have private property interests are are heard as well. Thank you, and I yield Thank back. you very much. Uh, let me uh, turn to the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Lamas, for any questions you may have. And let me just uh, indicate, this will probably be the last now for now of questions because there's a vote that's coming up pretty soon. Um, uh, before I begin, I'd like to yield to Mr. Hastings. Real briefly, uh, thank you for the gentlelady for yielding. Uh, 
Ms. Maloney said that the, the private property right, water rights are protected, yet Title VI has language in there that essentially creates, potentially creates a new water right for wilderness areas, therefore only overturning a state's water rights. And I want to say that for the record, and I thank the gentle lady for yielding. Point, point of clarification, uh, NARIPA reserves water rights consistent Ma with state Mr. law. Mr. It Chairman? is not uh, attempting to I'm over not, I'm over over I'm overrule that. So it, it is consistent with state law that re preserves water rights. Ms. Lim. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin with my five minutes, uh, I would like to ask unanimous consent to submit my opening statement for the record and several other documents. Specifically, I would like to submit letters of opposition and in some cases formal resolutions of opposition to H.R. 980 from the following interests and entities in Wyoming the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, the Wyoming County Commissioners Association, the Wyoming Weed and Pest Council, the Board of Lincoln County Commissioners, Wyoming Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife, the Sublette County Conservation District, the Star Valley Conservation District, the Sublette County Assessor, the Wyoming Republican Party Central Committee, the Wyoming Mining Association, and most importantly, the Wilderness Society, Wyoming Office. Mr. Chairman, may I submit those Without documents objection. for the record? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, to one of the previous speakers, Ms. Shea Porter, uh, you mentioned that you want to be able to come and enjoy the beauty of other areas of the country, and the fact of the matter is this bill will make it so you will not be able to come and enjoy that beauty because wilderness areas will exclude you from being able to come and enjoy that beauty. Um, questions uh, for the sponsor. Um, Representative Maloney, how many years have you been pursuing this legislation? 19 years. <laughs> well, you're tenacious, and I uh, applaud your tenacity. Although I'm often I'm described as a tenacious legislator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me ask you some questions. During those 19 years, um, how much time have you spent or have the bill supporters spent in Wyoming working to gain support from local people or vetting the impacts with locally elected officials or gathering the viewpoints of local public land managers in Wyoming? I have uh, spent uh, two weeks in the designated area talking to um, leaders in the area. In Wyoming? And, uh, and I've been, yeah, Wyoming and, and uh, I, I, Wy Wyoming and uh, other other parts, Montana. I've been I've been there. And Mr. Chairman, down where the, down the Salmon River, <laughs> I saw two bears and an eagle. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can you tell and me? And the where Wilderness Act provides for reasonable access to private in holding. So I don't understand why the person couldn't get access to their property because the federal law says it should be protected. Have you ever so been to Pinedale, Wyoming? Pinedale, Wyoming. No, I have not been to Pinedale. Oh. Afton, Wyoming? Uh, no, I've been to the capital of Wyoming. Um, the capital is where I live, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it is about an eight-hour drive or about 400 miles away from the area that we're talking about. Um, if Central Park were on fire, the trees were on fire, w would it be all right with you that the, the, fo the fire be put out? Absolutely. And why is that? because it's very dangerous to the people uh, living right by Central Park. And indeed, in that fact, six people in the census reported they lived in Central Park. <laughs> so uh, Mr. So Chairman, uh, that would also be the case with the people who live in and near the area of designation for wilderness. Would you, if, if the trees were being destroyed in Central Park by, by uh, insects, uh, would you agree to having those trees uh, treated to prevent it from spreading all over Central Park and killing Absolutely. every Absolutely. And, and, and we are doing that right now. The Asian longhorn beetle, regret, regretfully, is attacking Central Park now. Well, it's We're uh, trying to keep it uh, Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I feel for you, and I feel for uh, the residents of Wyoming who are suffering through pine beetle damage that they cannot pr uh, get adequate protection from. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you consent to removing the roads that uh, cross Central Park, uh, the, that uh, transfer Central Park? Well, Central Park is not a wilderness area. Uh, Central Park is a park, and uh, uh, certainly the roads are an important part of it. It is not a wilderness designation. The, the, uh, 
it's apples and oranges it's not a accurate comparison and i can assure you mr chairman the roads are an important part of the areas that we're talking about here uh, to the people who live here uh, my time is up thank you mr chairman thank you dr christensen any comments questions thank you mr chairman i, I don't have any questions i'd just like to um, comment that the goals, as I see it, of HR 980 are laudatory. They're needed to protect the ecosystems that are being referenced here. And there apparently is, looking at some other testimony, broad grassroots support for it. Uh, again, looking through some of the later testimony, there are, are probably some areas um, that we may need to review more closely and maybe amend it as we go through the process. But I think that the goals of the legislation to um, protect these ecosystems and also create jobs ought to be achieved in the uh, at the end of the process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ensley. Uh, thank you, Congressman Maloney. When we do these wilderness bills, we frequently have all kinds of adjustments to take into consideration local concerns about boundaries, about water, about recreational access and the like. We just finished one up in the state of Washington where we did that. Um, I'm making the assumption that that you and other co-sponsors, I'm one of the co-sponsors of the bill, are amenable to local concerns about specific boundaries, about specific Absolutely. recreational issues. Absolutely. Access, boundaries, treatment. So is Absolutely there any? Absolutely amenable. I, I think one of the, one of the reactions I've, I've heard to the bill is people think because it's multi-state, and multi-congressional district. We historically have done just wilderness pieces mm -hmm. one at a time, congressional district by at a time. It doesn't really fit the ecology very well because elk and deer and you know bears don't respect congressional boundaries. I can't understand why, but they don't. <laughs> um, and I think people are, are, are troubled or it's, it's kind of a foreign concept that you do a wilderness that actually crosses political boundaries. Now, I don't myself don't have a problem with that if if we respect the ability of local citizens to have real input on specific boundaries on issues of you know we had an issue whether boy scouts could use a trail they've always used before for instance and we work through it in our wilderness and I assume we could do the same thing in this type of larger approach is there any reason we couldn't no that's absolutely the legislative process moving forward congressman Weber do you disagree with that I guess the question is I mean let's assume that we have issues about the Montana proposal the part in Montana let's say that you have concerns about you know, mountain bikers or, or motorcycle riders or some you know issues about access like that is there any reason we couldn't work through those in a multi-state bill like this just like we do when we do it one smaller unit at a time. We even have difficulty doing it uh, between forests. And might I just suggest to you, Mr. Inslee, that your grizzly bear killed one of my dogs last year. Your wolves got into my corrals and killed 55 of my goats on private property. So your animals don't necessarily respect state boundaries, county boundaries, or ranch boundaries. And I, as a manager of the land, have to deal with your problem. Well, so why wouldn't a previous speaker respect our position in having to manage the property on behalf of the American public so your trees are not dying from beetles, your trees are not burning, your lands are not creating noxious weeds on my property because your government, our government, and us through the appropriations process do not appropriate enough dollars to control our problem. And so yes, it is necessarily an us versus you because we're not getting the kind of relief or recognition that we're the ones that have to deal with the problems as they arise. Well, I must show that sometimes Huskies and Cougars disagree. Uh, well, mountain lions are a big problem on my ranch as I well. I understand. I, I will show I disagree with you. Those aren't my grizzlies. They're our grizzlies. Those aren't my Then puppies. allow us an opportunity Those are to change our the Endangered Species Act so that we can manage them appropriately so we don't find ourselves in lawsuits when they are finally reestablished as the rules suggest that we should well, let me, do let me get back limit to the, the appeals. Let me get back to the real question that I want to ask you. And I think it is a serious question, okay? So I'd ask you to think about this seriously. I mean, when we do wilderness bills, we f we frequently work through all of these numerous issues to massage and sand these bills to get it down where there's something where there's 
can be supported by local communities. Is there any reason intrinsically that we could not do that in Montana or, and this is my question, the heart of my question, or would you just be resistant to any wilderness designation in this in this area? Not at all. And I guess what I've figured out, having been in Congress long enough, that uh, on both sides of the extreme, people will support reform as long as it doesn't change anything. <laughs> and that is the difficulty we have with the endangered species as we try to make changes. And that is the difficulty we find ourselves in wilderness designation. I have suggested three criteria, hard relief, a limitation on appeals, and a recognition of state water rights. And I know we don't necessarily talk about other legislation before Congress, but the Clean Water Reauthorization Act wants to federalize state water. And so we are real fearful of the changes. And it isn't east versus west, it's urban versus rural. So are you opposed to any wilderness designation in Montana under, under the existing endangered species law? Well, again, I suggested if we address the issues of particular concern, we get a local buy-off, a local understanding, and a local um, consent, and a recognition of a limitation of the appeals process, hard release, and raw rights, then we have something to talk about. Thank you. Any follow-up comments? Questions? Comments? Both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Maloney, if you can, if you can short sentence, just tell me what the intent of the bill is. It's to protect uh, lands that are owned by the American people, federal lands, and uh, preserve them for the natural habitat, uh, uh, for the uh, caribou, the, the grizzlies, the deer, the natural habitat for the animal life, and to uh, preserve the, the uh, foliage and the, the plant life and uh, it respects the water rights of states. It's written into the bill that states' water rights are, are respected. I think that's a, a core important point. I, we found one thing we agree on, Jenny. Thank but, you. Uh, I, I, I just want to get to the chase on this one. Uh, anywhere in your bill, does it allow for any public development? Not, not, on, uh, not, on, not in the wilderness area, on private land, certainly. On private land, you, you have uh, guaranteed access and you, you can do whatever you want on your land. Um, is, is this possibly uh, an issue that uh, is a divisive issue that uh, uh, this federal land is not going to be allowed to be developed for future, um, in, uh, um, uh, how would I say, entrepreneurship of communities or of businesses? Uh, is this why some of this opposition has come up? Is there something in the background we don't know about? Federal land is owned by the American taxpayer. I, I assume the, the uh, federal government, if they wanted to, could take it and sell it to individuals for development. Uh, th that, that could happen. Uh, that's one thing that we want to do is to preserve it. We want to preserve it. Uh, uh, and it's important not only for the, for the wildlife and, and the habitat and to have the natural corridors, it, it's important to protect the water and, and to protect the uh, the beauty of it and to protect the uh, naturalness of it. In, in the past, in sitting in some of the uh, committee and subcommittee hearings, there's a point been brought up that uh, the federal um, uh, government owns more property than almost anybody else and uh, essentially uh, unable to keep, um, how would I say, management, upkeep, uh, infrastructure, et cetera. Well, I've, I've always been of, and this is a personal comment, that if we hadn't spent as much money in Iraq, we'd be able to have some funds to be able to have agencies' budgets not cut and be able to carry out their full function. And that's my personal opinion. Uh, and and uh, I guess maybe I can go back to the Title 16 issue of $7, $7 million being allocated for this year's budget with $500 million in backlog, already approved congressional bills. So that's a personal comment. But... Uh, th there's always two sides to an issue, and you are apparently willing to sit and look at input or comments or uh, possible amendments that will help be able to uh, ameliorate some of the concerns. I, I, I believe that process would be very helpful going forward, and, and certainly any, uh, any changes that my good friends and colleagues have raised, if they would put it forward in a an amendment form so we could continue, so we could debate it and uh, discuss it and move forward. So Mr. Rayburg, what say ye? I'm not sure there's a left enough time in all of our congressional terms <laughs> Try. to fix this bill. Try. 
you're not willing to give, you're not willing to input, you're not willing to work? Well, let me answer your question about uh, uh, development of federal properties. This is already owned by us. This is already controlled by the United States Congress and the Forest Service and the executive branch. Mm -hmm. And so what's wrong with allowing an opportunity for the land to be managed under the existing form with opportunities for access? You know, we briefly talked mm -hmm. about being firm. I mean, unless you're an able-bodied young person that has the ability to access this property, what you're essentially doing is setting it aside for multiple use management. You're taking out the management skills, opportunities, knowledge, and education of the land managers that we, in fact, hire. So I don't mean to be derogatory nor insulting to our federal land managers, but I think this kind of legislation is. Because it's suggesting a hands-off approach. Where Ms. Lummis was heading is the fact that if a forest fire starts on this property now, you can't fight it. If the toxic weeds get out of control, you can't go in and spray it. And so you're taking yeah. away much of the management opportunities of our property. Danny, I, I, I kind of beg to differ on some of those issues because I am, am subcommittee chair of Water and Power, and I'm looking at the ability for forests to talk to uh, Bureau of Land Management to talk to others to be able to allow to go in and do some of the cutting of the brush so that there is less opportunity for wildfires. But anyway, not, not on wilderness uh, property. Uh, this is federal property. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bishop. And then we'll go. Yeah, go I just have one very, very quick comment. Well, actually, two. And, and once again, there's the difference between wilderness and other designations, which is, I think, what Mr. Reberg was talking about. But, Ms. Maloney, I do want to say one thing to you. There was an implication that was made earlier today that New York City is ugly. <laughs> and it's not as pretty as our pristine areas. I want you to know, I personally think New York City is a beautiful city. I have family there. I am very proud of that city. I don't think it needs to be replicated because it's one of the one, one of the originals, and unfortunately, the Yankees lost last night, oh. which was very difficult for me to watch on television. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you for your statement, and uh, I certainly uh, would uh, like to work with you to allow weeds and invasive species, uh, whether it's longhorn beetle or whatever, to be fought and controlled. I would think the federal land uh, management would be there in, in two seconds trying to fight invasive spe species and fires. Thank you. Only if you, could, only if you can insist that Robert's Robinson Cano gets one more at-bat with the bases loaded in the bottom of the ninth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to place a letter of support into the record. Thank you. Yeah, just let me quote from the Wilderness Act, if I may, uh, Section 4D1. In addition, such measures may be taken as may be necessary in the control of fire, insects, and diseases, subject to such conditions as the Secretary deems desirable. If there is the need for us to mm -hmm. augment that or look at that, or, but I don't know. Ms. Shea Porter. I just wanted to say one last thing, that I do represent federal land as well. And I heard what the congressman said, that it's rural versus urban. But in New Hampshire, my district is mm -hmm. urban and rural. And we managed to work these things out in a pretty much nonpartisan manner. And I, I think that we could go a long way if we could hear one another on these issues. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The issue of noxious weeds came up. And I, wanted, I just want to relate a story that happened in a district that uh, is part of my district that is no longer my district. It's in uh, Kathy McMorris and Rogers district, by the way. It's good timing. And there was an issue there of uh, a local agency, a weed control board, trying to control noxious weeds. And the noxious weeds came from federal land. Now, this wasn't wilderness area. This was multiple purpose national forest. And this noxious weed was taken over private lands and apparently the Forest Service wasn't doing enough because their approach to dealing with this noxious weed was to literally go up there one at a time and spray each weed. Now I have to tell you that is not a cost effective way to do it nor it is a comprehensive way to take care of noxious weeds. Now if you leave it to the secretary in order to deal with problems like this that come up, that's what you're going to get. 
The intention, of course, was to get rid of noxious weeds. And I, I, I went up there and I saw it. I, it, was, it was absolutely incredible to me. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your, uh, your forbearance on that. I just wanted to point out that sometimes these things sound good, but they're not good in practice, and you don't realize that until you live in those areas and see a number of these stories come back at you to, to make the point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Anyone else have any follow-up questions? I hope not, but if you do, let me know now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you very much, colleagues. Appreciate it. And uh, I'll invite the next panel up. Extend the invitation to both colleagues to, if they want to join us at the dais, they're welcome. Without objection. Gentlemen, good to see you again. I don't know if it's good <laughs> for you to see us, but it's good to see you. Uh, and let me uh, welcome you again and uh, begin with uh, Mr. Joel, Joel Holtrop, Deputy Chief, National Forest System, Forest Service Chief. Welcome and looking forward to your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, and it is always good to see you. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to, to provide the department's view on the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act. We appreciate the intent of the bill in terms of protecting important landscapes and biological corridors, as well as the work of those who seek to protect these special places. National forests and grasslands in the states of Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming have truly remarkable features and provide important habitat for many species. That is why we have ongoing planning efforts that are working towards many of these and other outcomes with an approach that better involves those who work and live in the affected communities. Therefore, we support additions to the Wilderness Preservation System and the Wild and Scenic River System using the existing land management and study processes that we are currently using throughout the region. The proposal contained within the bill provides important insights and information for agency decision makers to use in analyzing future management options throughout this region. We appreciate the work on this proposal and look forward to engaging those who are advocating on behalf of the values expressed in this bill. Throughout the Northern Rockies, revision of the 1980s era forest plans are underway. Organizations with diverse interests who in the past have been at odds with each other, such as wilderness advocates, wildlife and fisheries groups, mountain bikers, snowmobilers, timber companies, mill owners and ranchers are working collaboratively with each other and the Forest Service to resolve differences on the best approach to national forest management. This bill would, unfortunately, shortcut much of this collaboration and collective ownership of solutions. When the public has the opportunity to be heard and we understand their concerns, the agency makes better recommendations and decisions and those decisions are more easily implemented and enforced. People support what they help to create. To date nationwide, Congress has designated over 35 million National Forest System acres in the National Wilderness Preservation System. The wilderness designations in this bill would add an additional 19 million acres to the existing wilderness system. It would designate an additional 7.8 million acres of biological connecting corridors with some acres designated as wilderness and others subject to special corridor management requirements. Some of the areas proposed for designation are consistent with our publicly vetted forest plans. However, many are not. Our forest planning teams must and do consider the broader region, including wildlife movement, in their analyses. To date nationwide, Congress has designated almost 5,000 miles of wild and scenic rivers to be managed by the Forest Service. This bill would add 2,000 miles of designated rivers in the five-state area. Again, some of the rivers proposed for designation in this bill are consistent with our publicly vetted forest plans. 
however this bill proposes designating additional wild and scenic rivers before the agency has had the opportunity to analyze whether they are suitable for such as ignition this may create issues with private property owners recreational access mining claimants and permit whose livelihood may depend on the forest for service employees have been an integral member of communities throughout rural america for over one hundred years the health of our national forests is intertwined with the health of these communities we can work together with both local communities in the northern rockies as well as with americans who love the same forests from a distance to maintain the health of both the forests and communities we need to continue to encourage the collaborative processes as are occurring on the many national forests in the northern rockies we encourage those who are involved in supporting this bill to work with us to protect and sustain the national forests of the nation of the northern rockies and the important habitat they provide as we develop and implement our forest and project plans again we look forward to working with all affected interests as we move forward in managing and protecting these magnificent forests i would refer you, refer you to my prepared statement for additional information and i would be pleased to answer any questions you may have thank you sir let me uh, ask mr michael ned acting deputy director bureau of land management department of interior for your comments uh, mr director Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee to invite the Department of Interior to testify on H.R. 980, the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act. This legislation proposes wide-ranging designation on over 23 million acres of federal land in Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. These designations include wilderness, wild and scenic rivers, and biological connecting corridors on land administered by the Bureau of Land Management the U.S. Forest Service, and the National Park Service. Many of the lands identified in this legislation deserve special designation. However, we are concerned that certain designation in the bill may present serious conflicts with uses that may be of importance to the public. The conservation designation in the recent Omnibus Public Land Management Act of 2009 may serve as a good model for refining this approach in H.R. 980, especially over such a broad and diverse set of lands. In our testimony today, we will address proposed designation on land administered by the BLM and the National Park Service. Karen Taylor Goodridge from the National Park Service is accompanying me here and will be happy to answer any question related to National Park Service designation. However, the vast majority of the designation in H.R. 9 980 are on lands administered by the Forest Service. We defer to the Forest Service in those designation. A complete review of H.R. 980 is hindered by the lack of detail map for BLM managed area proposed for designation. Our preliminary review of available information suggests that the bill would designate as wilderness between one and three million acres of land administered by the BLM. We applaud recent effort across the West brought to fruition in the ominous Omnibus Public Land Management Act of 2009 to designate many treasured landscape as wilderness. While there is no single model that works better than all others, these designations all involve extensive local and national debate and discussion, which was critical to their success. Based on the very general information contained in the proposed designation, we believe it is clear that there are many BLM managed land much deserving of designation in this proposal. However, we also note there are areas with substantial conflict. They should be considered carefully to prevent unnecessary resource management conflict. The Department of Interior stands ready to participate in discussion about specific wilderness designation within the Northern Rockies. H.R. 980 would also designate nearly 3 million acres of wilderness in Glacier, Yellowstone, and Grand Teton National Park. The National Park Service supports these wilderness designations. We look forward to future opportunity to expand the protection of treasured American landscape, realizing, realizing the recently enacted Omnibus Public Land Management Act. The models presented in that legislation may serve as a guide to resolve wilderness and other designation issues throughout the West. I'll be happy to answer any questions you or the committee may have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to uh, recess so that uh, we, we may go vote, and it uh, should be about 20, 25 minutes. And we'll return and resume questioning. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Oh, please. Um, I have a, a statement I'd like to submit to the record, an opening statement. Objection. And I just want to get that in. Without, okay. without objection. Thank you. Okay. 
and uh, we'll resume. Uh, are you coming back? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so uh, let, let us recess now and resume with any questions we might have for the gentleman when we come back. Thank you.